I was drinking every single day at the end and it was chronic and severe alcoholism. Hello and welcome to the School of Rock Bottom with me guest host Izzy Hawkins. It got to the point that as soon as I stopped drinking within half an hour my body was shaking. I, I was at the end being woken up in the night with shakes. Yeah. I went down to nine and a half stone so I'm currently 12 so take two and a half stone off me like I was dying. Oh people were looking at me going this guy is dying you know I wasn't one of these people that was like oh I can see where this is leading and I'm gonna rein it in. No I had to literally get into the jaws of the devil see the devil about to squish my head. And then I'm like, okay, maybe now I'll jump out. I would get a month and then I'd pick up a drink and I'd, it would end up in chaos again. I'd get three months. At one point I got a year and I sort of celebrated with a drink. Um, Classic. Which is brilliant. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to celebrate a year not shooting myself in the foot by shooting myself in the foot. Yeah. I, I'd go to a meeting and then have a drink at the pub and then ring up a friend and go, oh, the meeting was great. You know, I just couldn't wrap my head around this idea of abstinence it sounded insane you feel like you've got two choices left either you carry on drinking which is obviously incredibly painful or you get sober and you're looking at those two options and you don't know which one's the best one mm. both seem equally as painful and that was the moment where i just went i'm done because there was clearly something strong within you that wanted to live, that yeah. wanted to like kick this thing. How did you get clean and sober? Like, what did that journey look like? Hello and welcome to the School of Rock Bottom with me, guest host Izzy Hawkins. I am an actor and sobriety advocate who knows firsthand that Rock Bottom can be the greatest teacher and the springboard for a beautiful life. Today... I get to interview the host of the show, actor and recovery coach, Oliver Mason. The shoe is on the other foot today. It certainly is. I'm so, so grateful for you doing this today. Thank you so much. Isabel. Absolutely. Really I'm excited to find out more about you. And um, yeah, it's going to be great. So Oliver has starred in West End shows and BBC dramas and has been part of cult classics like Red Dwarf, The Misty Show and Doctor Who. He's also a familiar face from his time presenting on the BBC, CBBC and the Disney Channel. He's also voiced characters in video games like Dragon Age and in landmarks like Buckingham Palace. Oliver has been sober for over nine years. We are the same amount of sober time Ooh, and works as a recovery coach, helping others in addiction treatment centres. For more details, check out the show notes. I feel very important. I feel like you today. You did that really well. You smashed that. I think Thank my job's so under much. threat for sure. <gasps> watch out <laughs> so as you begin every every uh, episode that you do this podcast why don't you tell us a bit about your rock bottom thank you izzy yeah thanks so much and again thank you so much for uh hosting the show today um you know i talk about this a lot on the podcast that rock bottom doesn't necessarily mean that you've lost everything and you know rock bottom isn't always like really dramatic and also i talk a lot about addiction doesn't necessarily mean that you drink or, you know, or in my case, drink, but all use every day. Um, but unfortunately, in my case, uh, I was drinking every single day at the end and it was chronic and severe alcoholism. And my rock bottoms, there was many, uh, were, were extreme. Uh, and it was really, really difficult to pick one, actually. So I'm going to take you back to a day in 2013. Uh, I woke up. And my first thought was, oh, shit, I'm alive. That was my first thought. And my second thought was, where's the vodka bottle? And in a panic, my go-to was at this point under the bed, and I, and I couldn't find it. And as I desperately was going around my flat like a madman trying to find this bottle, I was hallucinating. I could see dark shadows in my house. They were screaming in my ear my name. Uh, there were bugs crawling on me. Um, the, my house looked like I'd been burgled and, and trashed. And I finally found some vodka. I, I took a swig. I immediately threw it up. I took another swig and it stayed down. And then I realized I was out. And I looked at the clock and I didn't know if it was... 7.30 in the morning or 7.30 at night. I didn't really know what day it was. By this point, I'd been drinking every day for, for quite a while. Um, and I was so panicked that there was no alcohol in the house because I started to shake. My body was violently shaking that 
I started to convince myself that I could drink bleach. And I thought, if I mix that with orange juice, isn't that a drink that they drink in Europe somewhere? And, th and then I realized that was insane. And then I ran outside and I was going through recycling bins trying to find alcohol. And when I couldn't really find any, I was like, what am I doing? Get to the off license. So I ran to the off license and it was shut. And I was really confused because according to my clock, it was eight. So it was either 8 a.m. or 8 p.m. I wasn't quite sure. Anyone who suffered chronic alcoholism will know what that feeling is like. It's really terrifying. And I thought, where are they? You know, there was my go-to guy. Everything was shut up. And then half past eight, he arrives. And I asked for a bottle of vodka. And he said he can't serve me. And I said, why not? He said, it's Christmas Day. I had no idea it was Christmas Day. He said, you're going to have to wait till 10 o'clock. Now, in 2013, if there was delivery services on Christmas, I don't I hadn't... My world had got so small, there was just my flat and the off-license at this point. And um, that two hours waiting for him to serve me that, that bottle of vodka took forever. And I ordered a bottle of vodka and three bottles of wine. And I went back to my flat. I was supposed to be with family. It was Christmas Day. And I rang them up and I said, I'm still in London. I've missed the train. I was supposed to get the train the day before. And I just sat on my bed looking around at all these cards um, get well soon cards because I'd been ill for a, for a good time all saying can't wait to see you at Christmas and I just broke down crying and just thought how have I got here and it was probably one of the most depressing days of my life being sat in that flat with that alcohol I've got much more dramatic ones but in terms of sort of where I was at and the emotional impact and the powerlessness complete powerlessness that, that I felt um, yeah, I thought I'd share that one to kick us off. Oh, yeah. I mean, cheery. It's cheery and so powerful. Like I just, I, that feeling of when you can't get <clears throat> your fix is honestly, isn't it just the worst feeling in the entire world? Horrendous. Yeah. Um, so I guess a question I would have is why now? Why, why at this stage do you want to tell your story? I think stigma, prejudice, fear. It was a lot of things. I mean, when I started this podcast, which was last year, um, I wanted to tell my story straight away. Um, but I think on one hand, I wanted it to be about the guest story. I didn't really want this podcast to be about me. I think checking in with my own ego and why I'm doing this is, is really important for me on this journey as it continues, you know. Um, so there was a little bit of that. But, you know, I've obviously got family. I've also got I work in other areas within the industry. So I'm not just an actor, but I run a theatre school. Um, youth development is something that I'm really, really passionate about. So I sort of wanted to take into consideration my family, my wider family, and also my professional life. And I, and I knew the time was right. Uh, in the, I knew there was, a, sorry, a right time in the future, but it, I wanted to be sure. I actually say this always to my guests as well. I've had people that have taken a year to come on. They've just not felt ready. Mm -hmm. And I've said, just wait, even if even if it's in five years. And it just felt right at this time. Mm -hmm. And also, I should say that the theatre school that I work with, um, they've been incredibly supportive. So I, I got the green light, basically, mm -hmm. from all the right people. And it feels the right time to, to do it now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is amazing and uh, we commend you for that because it's an incredibly vulnerable thing to do. Mm. Um, so in terms of being sober, so you've been sober for nine years now. Yeah. What would you say have been your biggest challenges in that? I mean, I think my own mind, particularly at the beginning, um, relapse, unfortunately, was a massive part of my journey at the beginning. So, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't get sober straight away. So it was 2013, it took me to 2015 to stay stopped. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's a phrase we use in, in recovery, but, you know, to stay stopped. But, you know, obviously, the f I was so physically addicted. Um, not everybody gets to that point with alcoholism. But it got to the point that as soon as I stopped drinking, within half an hour, my body was shaking. I, I was at the end being woken up in the night with shakes. You know, that, my body was like, where's the alcohol? It got, it got that chronic and severe. I mean, my alcoholism was really kind of like end of life. I went down to nine and a half stone. So I'm currently 12. So take two and a half stone off me. Like I was dying. Oh People were looking at me going, this guy is dying, mm -hmm. you know. And um, 
So there was the physical, like the physical withdrawal. I definitely had something called pause, which is post acute withdrawal syndrome. So I remember being two and a half months sober and still getting the shakes. Uh, in very early recovery, I was terrified to drink coffee because I thought I was going to have a panic attack. My anxiety was through the roof. I was sharing in in uh, mutual support groups that I felt like a nerve in the wind. Um, and then once that passed, for me, it took about three to four months. It was really just my mind getting in the way. Um, and I think addiction, I, I look at addiction as I call it the liar in my mind. So I've got this little bit in my in my head that tries to convince me that drinking is a good idea again. Well, obviously, I've just told you my rock bottom. It's clearly not a good idea again. So it's trying to convince me and, and it will use, uh, you know, real simple things like just one won't hurt or it'll be different this time, right through to whole themes. So fear is a big theme that, it's tr that it tries to use. Not so much now. Mm -hmm. um, and again, the lies continue. So with fear, uh, the two main li lies I experience are you're going to lose what you have. So you've got good health, you're going to lose that. You've got a good relationship, you're going to lose that. Um, so it almost takes my gratitude list and then uses that as proof that <laughs> yeah. of things that I'm going to lose, which is something that it does with also with step one, if anyone's familiar with the steps. Um, addiction likes to use my, it did used to like to use my step one as evidence that I'm a terrible human being. Well, obviously, it's just evidence that drinking isn't a good idea. Mm -hmm. So yeah, fear is, you know, you're going to lose what you've got or you're not going to get what you want. Mm -hmm. And so fear has sort of been a, a running theme that over the years has just got less and less and less, you know, with time. Um, anger is another theme. And I think the life for me around anger is um, people, places and things should be doing what you want them to do. Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> that one. <laughs> love to tell me that one. And then the other one is self-pity, you know, and I think early on it was my addiction telling me you're a piece of shit and don't don't deserve recovery. Or life is terrible, what's the point? Or others are better than you. And so recovery for me has been a complete clear out of my mental health about perspective of self, perspective of how I think and how I react to others. It's so multifaceted, as you know. Mm -hmm. But I would say my own mind is, yeah, tried to get... The biggest <laughs> obstacle. Yeah. And actually separating myself from my addiction. I don't see myself as my addiction anymore. I see it as part of who I am, a little bit like my little finger, but that doesn't mean that is who I am. And I think that separation is important. And it's something that I found impossible early on. In terms of those obstacles, has the industry played a part in that? In sobriety, but I suppose in addiction as well, kind of has the industry and the madness that comes with being in this job, has that has it affected you or played into it? Yeah, I mean, 100%. I mean, you know, I, I deal with the industry so much better in recovery there was a point in early recovery that I thought, I don't know if I can stay sober and be an actor. Mm -hmm. That was a real conversation that I had to have with myself. I thought, I don't know if I can stay sober in this industry. Because for me, I, I, I don't feel this way now, but I had such a toxic relationship with it. And a lot of it was of my own making and my own ego and my own expectations. Um, again, I don't feel like this way now, but you know, I left drama school and I got... I got success quite, quite quickly. And, you know, you, you're sort of in your early twenties, you're, you're in the West end, you're, you're getting a lead part in a BBC thing you're presenting. And I guess I just kind of thought that I was on a flight of stairs that was going to carry on. And when it just stopped and it, for me, it felt very abrupt. Something also happened at the same time. My best friend from university died in a drink driving accident. Mm. And, um, it was a pivotal moment. And, and I think I went into a lot of fear and self-pity and, and my relationship with the industry started to get quite bitter, I think. Not all the time, but particularly on the weekends when I was drinking and um, I was projecting a lot of negativity, I think, out into the universe around it. And it just, it was like a feedback loop. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think, yeah, it just, it just got worse and worse. And I, and I blamed the industry for a lot of things. And now I just don't see it that way. I just see it as, you know, <laughs> this thing that, that exists, but, you know, it, it doesn't trigger me in that way mm -hmm. anymore. I, I just see it as something that I have access to like everybody else and mm -hmm. you just got to work hard and do your bit. But yeah, before I saw it, it as like a, this really toxic relationship. And you know? where do you think 
I mean, I have a question about how, like, what mm. what support methods you use, or like how you've managed to get sober. But what do you think has fed into that new attitude that you that you have towards the world and to the industry? I think I don't know if you'd agree, but I think I think in recovery, I've had to like really let go of outcome, really let go of expectations, and kind of just be and finding that you need to be grateful, not need to be grateful, it sounds like I'm forcing myself, <laughs> but finding a natural way to be grateful for where you're at mm -hmm. and just trying to live in the present more. And I think my identity was so wrapped up in being an actor, all my self-esteem was wrapped up in being an actor, that my last credit was everything. Mm -hmm. So if I hadn't worked in a month, I was a failure at one point. <laughs> I mean, I'd love to work <laughs> within a month now, do you know what I mean? Yeah. But... I think my ego was so huge and my self-esteem was so low. And, you know, in psychology, you call it like the authentic self versus the ego. There was a real disconnect. And I think that gap for me is a hotbed for addiction. And I think that's why there's a lot of performers in recovery. Yeah. Because of that disconnect, that expectation. Don't you know who I think I am? Versus this inner child, if you like, that's that's got low self-esteem and and is craving love and validation and then this massive gap and for me that's where booze came in mm -hmm. and, and other stuff as well yeah if that makes any sense until yeah. you start to do the work and then you sort of close that gap don't you and you understand yourself better 100 yeah. percent. um which speaking of the work so coming from that awful rock bottom moment that you described how how did you get clean and sober like what did that journey look like for me it was really difficult i mean you know they 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 say don't they that you know, relapse is part of recovery. I've heard some people talk about that. For me, relapse isn't part of recovery. Relapse is is part of addiction and alcoholism. However, relapse is part of my journey. And again, I'm just speaking for myself. I'm not a spokesman for anybody else. This is just purely my personal experience. But it's been, so even though I don't see relapse as part of recovery, I definitely do see it as part of the journey. And unfortunately, I had the type of alcoholism where it was like, you know, imagine a guy going to the doctor and being like, you know, doc, I've got this problem. I keep whacking myself in the head um, against the wall and it's and I'm bleeding and it's really hurting. And then the doc's like, I've got some advice for you. Stop doing it. Yeah. And so then I go, I leave the doc's surgery and then I whack my head. Then I take a chisel. Then I like slam it, you know, and I'm literally going to the doctor with my eyeballs hanging out and half my face and my brain's gushing. Oh, n now I get it. Mm. That was me. You know, I wasn't one of these people that was like, oh, I can see where this is leading and I'm going to rein it in. No, I had to literally get into the jaws of the devil, see the devil about to squish my head. And then I'm like, OK, maybe now I'll jump out. And I think that was always going to be the story with me, unfortunately, because it was so wrapped up in my identity I remember saying to a, ther to a therapist, I can't get sober. And they said, why? Well, I said, because I said, alcohol is in my DNA. And really believing that mm -hmm. 100%. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I would get a month and then I'd pick up a drink and I'd, it would end up in chaos again. I'd get three months. At one point, I got a year when I sort of celebrated with a drink. Um, Classic. Which is brilliant. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to celebrate a year not shooting myself in the foot by shooting myself in the foot. Yeah. This is great. Um, yeah, lots of relapses. I mean, a lot of this stuff is quite embarrassing. But it's not to be gratuitous. It's to say I was really ill. Mm -hmm. And if if you're listening to this and you're in the same boat, there is a way out of this. I mean, I was the guy that I've been kicked out of meetings. Because I was drunk, talking shit. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't feel proud saying that, but that's my truth. Um, you know, I, I, I'd go to a meeting and then have a drink at the pub and then ring up a friend and go, oh, the meeting was great. You know, I just couldn't wrap my head around this idea of abstinence. It mm -hmm. sounded insane. Yeah. Absolutely insane. And, and I just tried everything. Acupuncture, 12-step fellowship. That was the last thing I tried. Um, intuitive recovery, therapy, smart recovery, basically anything I tried. The only thing I didn't try was hypnotherapy. I think I tried everything else. And the last place I wanted to go was a 12-step fellowship. 
that was the last place I wanted to go. Which is so interesting as well, like all of those things that you tried, because there was clearly something strong within you that wanted to live, that yeah. wanted to like kick this thing. 100%. Um, and so you land in the 12th Step <clears throat> Fellowship and something stuck, I suppose. Um, like talk a little bit about that program, I suppose, and what it is that you think that finally helped you. Yeah, I mean, again, this is slightly embarrassing to say, but I was in a therapy session and I was coming towards the end of this six months with this person. And it was in it was actually in an alcohol service, mm -hmm. um, Camden Alcohol Service, which is somewhere I ended up volunteering for a long time. Big up Camden Alcohol Service. Amazing place. Anyway, she kept saying to me, we used to have therapy on a Monday. There's a, there's a meeting at six. And I kept saying, I'm not going in there. They're all crazy. It's a cult and they want my money and they're all religious nuts. And um, one week. This girl came in, and I'm embarrassed to say this, but she was very attractive. <laughs> and she said, there's a meeting at six. And I immediately said yes. Yay! <laughs> so a pretty girl got me in the room, That's basically. Cool. And then I went in and I shared and it, it all just came out. Um, but even that, I, you know, that was part of my story of relapse because I wasn't fully invested in it. So if they said, get a sponsor, you know, someone to help you. I remember announcing in a meeting that I was sponsoring myself. Mm -hmm. being very proud about that uh, <laughs> did you say that really yeah. early on yeah oh my I got god a sponsor me <laughs> oh i bet the old timers were like what do we do with this one yeah i was a nightmare um i my nickname in meetings early on was the thunderstorm of north london oh my god which i was quite proud of yeah as you can that's imagine. cool <laughs> <laughs> but i was just a nightmare basically and um i just yeah i just didn't want to do anything that was suggested but eventually i got to the point where talks about we talk about this in recovery where you feel like you've got two choices left either you carry on drinking which is obviously incredibly painful or you get sober and you're looking at those two options and you don't know which one's the best one mm. both seem equally as painful and that was the moment where i just went i'm done because i think the final life for me was my alcoholism is telling me that i didn't want to live and i actually remember quite quite strongly in those moments thinking i'm being lied to this is all part of a scam and i had memories of me as a kid running around in norfolk building haystacks running around i was a very ha very happy kid mm -hmm. always full of jokes and i thought what's happened to me there's some and then that survival instinct kicked in and then i was gung-ho that i was going to do it mm -hmm. from that moment isn't it so funny that you connect to that that child, because I remember having that in my rock bottom moment, yeah. looking in the mirror and being like, remembering that who that child was and yeah. the sort of the things that I'd hoped to go on to do and just the joy and wanting to be alive and experience the world. And then you when you're in that dark place, you're like, I could not be further from that child now. Yeah. It's yeah. Really dark place. Very. So going back to that happy child, mm. um, we talk a lot about addiction being progressive yeah. and is that something that you think is is true for you um and kind of what what was drink to you in those formative years yeah it's a great question um i i saw alcohol from a young age as something quite positive to be honest um you know i saw you know my dad liked to drink um i thought my dad was the coolest guy on earth I still do <laughs> um he looked like magnum pi he, he drove a sports car and he used to go up the pub and, and have a drink. And, and I thought that's what I'm going to do when I'm older. And I was in pubs, you know, 16 and, but there wasn't really anything like, I, I didn't have that moment where I, where I took a drink and it was like, wow. I remember drinking at 12, having a sip of vodka and thought it was disgusting. But what I do remember is being at a house party when I was 16 and there was, I think I was, I can't remember what year of school I was in, but there was a girl there in the upper six, right? And I tried to ask her out and it didn't go well. I was a little bit like Hugh Grant in Four Weddings and Funeral, you know, like oh, no. stuttering, blah, blah, blah. And then someone handed me a can of Castlemaine Forex. Mm -hmm. That's an old school beer. <laughs> I have no idea what that yeah, is. Exactly. I was like, yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an old school <laughs> beer. And I remember not being able to like, basically my plan was to ask her out and I couldn't, I couldn't do it. And, and then I went back into this party. Someone handed me a can of beer and I was like, I might as well have a swig of that. And I, and I drunk it almost down the entire thing. And I went back to her and I went, how you doing? I thought I was Joey from Friends. 
right? Because basically, in that period of time, Joey from Friends was like the coolest guy ever. Yeah. And so it gave me this huge rush of confidence. And really, my first addiction was to thinking. It just stopped that overthinking. Yeah. And so it was quite logical to go, let's get another one. But it didn't really progress because I had such a passion in acting. I went to uni. I went to drama school. We all drunk a lot in those days. Do you know what I mean? Like uni in the 90s and early 2000s was like, you know, it was lager, lager and yeah, you know, an oasis and all of that. Um, I, you know, my drinking wasn't different to my peers. And even in my 20s, I only ever drunk on the weekends, really. You know, I was really aware of alcohol's power from a, from a young age. And so I, I ring fenced my drinking pretty successfully for over a decade, just on sort of a Friday, Saturday night mm -hmm. when I'd go out and get drunk, <laughs> but I wouldn't drink on a Sunday. I, I remember being in pubs with friends who were having hair of the dogs and me going, no. So I thought this is a slippery slope. And then one day I had that hair of the dog and then it was thirsty Thursdays. Then it was happy on Wednesday. Then it was tipsy Tuesday and it's Monday night. I'm really depressed. Mm -hmm. I wonder why. So I'll have a drink. But even then I was going into work. I was only, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that stigma of addiction, which is where I ended up, that drinking, you know, to be an alcoholic, you have to drink every day and lose everything. Yes, that's where I got to. But we know that the vast majority of people in recovery aren't like that, actually. Apparently, only 9.2% in a rate thing actually are chronic and use every day or drink every day. The vast majority binge, stop, binge. And so that stigma of what alcoholism is um, just kept me in the loop of it. So I thought, like, this can't be alcoholism because mm -hmm. I'm going to work and it's not first thing in the morning and it's not every day. And so I did that for a while. And, yeah, the weekends just got longer and it got worse and worse and worse. I always used to think of alcoholism like a car that can do a million miles an hour. And some people put their foot on the pedal and it goes to a million miles an hour straight away. Mine wasn't like that. Mine was a slow one, two, three, four, yeah. over 10 years. And suddenly at some point I put my foot down and when it got hold of me, I was screwed. I couldn't get out. I just couldn't get out. It absolutely consumed me. Um, and it, it turned, I'm going to, I'm going to use the word demonic actually for me. I, I looked back in some old writer, rather arrogantly, I wrote some memoirs in early recovery. Mm -hmm. I called it Alcohol and I. <laughs> I <laughs> love that. Yeah. Ego is out of control. When are those coming out? And I read it back and all the language I was using, it was all like, it was really demonic. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I necessarily believe in that, but it, that's how it felt to me at the time. It was like a possession, like a demonic possession that I couldn't get out of. Mm -hmm. Really scary stuff, which you know. Yeah, it is like there is a demon that possesses your soul when you're in that place. And it's so interesting that you talk about the kind of the markers that we have to go, well, it's not a problem because, and it's not a problem because, and it's not a problem because. In a way, I'm really grateful that I started morning drinking quite quickly because then it was like, well, this is quite bad. <laughs> I feel like that's quite, that's quite a mark. But it's so interesting because I think there's so many more people have drinking problems than they realize because, yeah. but everyone goes, oh, I'm not putting vodka on my cornflakes and therefore I'm so fine. Um, so... You know, but talking about the difference between alcoholism and perhaps a heavy drink or a heavy user, what do you think that difference is? What do you think is the difference between you and somebody that is a heavy user or drinker? Um, I think, I mean, the sort of classic definition of alcoholism or addiction is, you know, out of the Oxford Dictionary is, you know, you carry, carrying on use or, or doing a certain behavior despite negative consequences. Mm -hmm. I think a heavy drinker, you know, if the wife turns around and says it's me or the booze, they're probably going to pick the relationship and, and, and calm it down and maybe consult a drink diary or <laughs> yeah, something like that. One of those. <laughs> I think when it's addiction, it's like, sorry, honey, it's, it's the drink, you know, yeah. or, or, or the relationship ends because of the drinking. Mm -hmm. Another marker for me is, is when I got negative consequences from drinking, that only served as more reasons to carry on. You know, I, I mean, probably the most dramatic one was going to the Royal Free Hospital, getting my liver results and being told if I carry on drinking, I'm going to get liver cirrhosis. And I turned around to the doctor and I said, I don't know why you told me that. You've now triggered me to have a drink. And the first thing I did was buy vodka on that knowledge. I don't think heavy drink is doing that. Mm -hmm. And I think the other marker is, I think we talked about this in your podcast is, you know, I can't, the reason I don't pick up a drink is I cannot be sure I can stop at one. 
And I think a heavy drinker can. I think if they had to just have one beer, I think they can guarantee it. For me, I might, you know, after nine and a half years, I might be able to have just one, but I'm, I might have 10. I might drink for a couple of hours. I might drink for three days. I just don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I think there's lots of markers like that for me personally. Yeah. yeah. We just like to take things to extremes, really, don't we? It's like yeah, more, more, more. Mm. But also, like, even in the drinking, it's just everything is extreme. Yeah. You touched on there, like, with a heavy drinker, if they're kind of questioned about whether it, it's me or the relationship, then, you know, they'll often choose the smart choice. <laughs> um, what have your what were your relationships like in addiction, like with family and the people around you? And have they have they improved? I would like to think they've improved. But, you know, how is how what does that look like now for you? Massively. I mean, I think that is the the major benefit for me being in recovery is that you know i've got such great relationships with with everyone really i mean it sounds a bit eggy and wanky what i've just said <laughs> you know everything's perfect but my relationships are so good with everyone that i care about um every good thing i have in my life is because i'm sober mm -hmm. you know and i would lose all of it probably almost instantly you know um I, you know i've always had a close ties to family but it absolutely fractured everyone and everything that i cared about and i think addiction is about you know it might start off in the vip lounge in a nice tuxedo but it always got me on my own in a dark room with a bottle and everyone just go away i think i heard in a podcast recently that if you're bad in society you go to prison but if you're bad in prison they put you in isolation and that's where i wanted to be mm -hmm. completely isolated and I just pushed everybody away. And I think there'll be some people listening or watching to this that have known me since I got sober and, and will be genuinely shocked by this because, you know, I have generally such a positive kind of, a bullion kind of life now. In, in, do you know what I mean? I, I live in positivity most of the time. But there was a period, twenty, particularly 2013, absolutely so bleak. Mm-hmm. And all I wanted to do was be on my own drink, basically, with little pockets of recovery in between mm -hmm. and another relapse. Yeah. And given like how night and day you are now compared to what you were like then, do you believe addiction is a disease? Oh, good question. So a disease is any organ of the body that is in a degenerative decline. And I think certainly an active addiction it's a disease 100 percent. i don't think you know there's any metric that you know if you if you if you do a brain scan of someone su suffering with alcoholism you're gonna you're gonna see straight away that their brain is 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 breaking down and of course with alcoholism it's alcohol such a pernicious drug it affects every part of the brain uh, every part of the body sorry you know other drugs will, will maybe target certain areas it will go everywhere it'll go into your lips and your skin and your teeth your hair follicles go everywhere um, but personally, I don't see it as a disease in recovery. I think we go into remission and I think, I think the story that we tell ourselves, I mean, listen, if you're in recovery and, and it helps you stay sober by, by saying, you know, I have a disease, that's great. But for me, that's so disempowering. Yeah. I agree. So, um, no, I don't see it as the disease in recovery, inactive addiction. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But you, we see this with other diseases, don't we? That, that go into remission. And I think alcoholism is the same. So, and yeah. And the key being it can always come back. 100%. Which is why you got to keep it in remission. Do the things you can to keep it in remission. I like that analogy. Yeah. It's a good analogy. Similar things happen with certain cancers, don't they? Due to, yeah, yeah. Due to other behaviours, you know, where, where you get the all clear, it's in remission. But, oh, if you go back to these behaviours or whatever it is, then it can come back. So I don't, you know, it sort of works in a similar way to other things that we see in, in the medical field, I think. So do you see it as addiction is kind of out to to kill you? Do you see it as that? Um, for me, addiction, again, this is just personal, is all about survival. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people in meetings that will say, or in the recovery community will say, my addiction is out to kill me. And I totally understand why they say it. I get it completely. But for me personally, that doesn't really vibe i actually think that my addiction has always wanted me to be alive has always wanted me to survive 
it just got really bloody confused along the way. And, you know, the weird thing that happened to me on that day where I was really suicidal, I thought to myself, if I'm dead, I won't be able to drink again. And that really stopped me. Yeah. And I remember for a long time thinking, wow, I'm so screwed up that that would stop me. But now it makes complete sense, particularly when you look at the neuroscience behind addiction, because it was always about survival. You know, it was to help me with anxiety, to fit in, to feel comfortable in my own skin. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you could do the same thing, right? Like I taught my brain that basically every emotion alcohol was good for. So bored, confused, happy, sad, worried, like name an emotion. I taught my brain that alcohol was good for that. I do the same with weather. It's raining outside. Let's have a lock in. Sunny outside. Let's go to a beer garden. Uh, traveling, studying, like it didn't matter what it was. I kept telling my brain, this is good for it. So it was always geared. It says in step one, doesn't it? That our lives became unmanageable. They weren't always that way. Um, and so, yeah, I I now in recovery just just see it as addiction was actually trying to save me. It just got very, very confused along the way. And so now when I have an intrusive thought, like just one isn't going to hurt, I'm like, oh, I call it the liar. You're a little bit confused. I know you're trying to help me out, mm -hmm. but it's all good. I don't know. That's a luxury of being sober for a while. But I think as time goes on, you get more pragmatic about your thoughts. Well, I do anyway. Not necessarily the first thought. Sometimes I have really weird th first thoughts. But how I respond to that first thought. So like if a drink, if a thought comes in like, I could have a drink, it's a similar thought to could go to Tesco, take all my clothes off and run around naked. Like, why would I do that? Like, it's just a silly thought. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to act on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like that thing you say about um, that, it's, that it is trying to keep you alive, um, your addiction. Because I think actually, in a way, it's also a warning signal, isn't it? Of like, what's... Because I often talk a lot about what once you put down the drink, you got to start working on what's underneath the reason you're drinking yeah. in the first place. And so yeah. it is a warning signal, I suppose, in a way to go, something's not right. And there's yeah. something you're not dealing with yeah. and you need to start dealing with it. Um, and speaking of those kind of like big emotions and that you were listing off, how do you go about, because I know it's something I still struggle with, <laughs> how do you go about dealing with all of those emotions? Because life is so, you know, difficult and exhausting and, and amazing. And there's, you know, there's so many... Yeah, emotions that we go through on a daily basis. How do you deal with those in anger and sadness and things? These yeah, days? that's a, oh, that's an amazing question. Um, if you don't mind, I'll just kind of break down the three that I spoke about. So, like with fear, so the main two lies that addiction likes to tell me is the first one being, you know, um, you're going to lose what you've got, or you're not going to get what you want. One acronym that I love with fear, I'm sure. Well, you're going to know in recovery, we love an acronym. We love it. We love it. The only one that I actually really love is false evidence appearing real. Mm, I've forgotten that one. Yeah, it's an Not like that in a while. <laughs> you know, my head loves to project into the future and create doom and gloom. And we're taught early on, aren't we, that it's just for today, live in the day. And actually, my work in progress is about living in the moment because I really believe if you live in the moment, um, that's where joy is. You know, like if you told me a really funny joke now and I barely laughed, like I'm forced into that moment. So all of that is just imagination. Yeah. You know, what I might lose, what I might not get. And so this is where the pragmatism has come in. And, and you know, they say in recovery, don't they, the antidote to fear is faith. And I think that's a really emotive word for people. Uh, it isn't for me now, but it would have been nine years ago. Even if you're an atheist, you can put your faith in recovery. Like, if you told me any negative consequence of drinking, um, I know 100% if I don't pick up a drug or a drink today, that it will have the opposite effect. So... For example, if I go back to drinking, um, I could lose my relationship. I know that if I don't have a drink today, that's going to make my relationship stronger. Another consequence might be money. Mm -hmm. You know, I know if I don't have a, a drink today, that I'm going to have more money in my back pocket. So, you know, just list all of the things that you could lose if you carry on drinking or whatever it is that you're in recovery from. And then you'll realize that if you don't pick up a drink, it will strengthen all of those areas. So if you can't put your faith in that, like, I don't know what you can put your faith in. Mm hmm. And I think it works on every level. So if you're into Eastern philosophy, you could say it's karma. If you're a Christian, you could say reap what you sow. And if you're a scientist, you could say cause and effect. And I think that's the benefit of recovery is that, again, that pragmatism starts to come in. Mm -hmm. You're like, well, that's not going to help anything. So for me, that fear goes by putting 
my the one thing that has never let me down is recovery. Like I've never woken up in the morning and gone, oh, that bad thing happened because I'm sober. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or you never wake up in recovery and go, oh, no, I didn't drink yesterday. Yeah. Idiot. You always wake up and go, well, that was a good idea. Mm -hmm. Shall I do that again? Yeah. Um, Self-pity. I mean, it's hard to kind of talk about it quickly, but, you know, gratitude is obviously such a antidote to self-pity. Um, having a gratitude list, you know, trying to practice gratitude daily. I, I, I'll quickly tell one story. I think I was about four, four months sober and, um, I rung up someone in recovery and I said, um, I said, I'm really angry. I said, you know, I think I said something like life's really hard and crap. And what's the point? And he turned around to me and he said, you know, that gratitude list you've been right. And he said, go back to it and find something on that list that proves what you said is bullshit. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I went back to it and I just found all, all these things that I'd written down that all had a point to them, mm. whether it was spending time with family or having a nice day out or, you know, having a nice conversation with somebody. I've, I'm yet to write down Oscar, won an Oscar. I'm yet to write down, won a Nobel Peace Prize. I think you'll know this, right? Like you start to notice the really small things. Yeah. The things that don't cost money. And your, light, your world just gets brighter and brighter and brighter, you know? Anger, yeah, for me, I still get angry. Um, you know, I think, I don't know if you've come across this in recovery, but <laughs> you get some people that get sober and they're very calm all the time. Yeah. You know, which is great. But personally. Oh, to be one of those oh, people. To be one of those, yeah. <laughs> but like, if you watch me watch an Arsenal game and someone scores against Arsenal and I'm not like screaming and shouting, going shit, yeah. like, like shoot me. Mm -hmm. um, I still get angry, but I think, I don't know if you'd agree, but like for me, recovery is all about manageability. Mm. And, you know, they talk about, you know, having a five seconds breathing in, pausing and all of that. For me, a very powerful question today is, have I ever done it? It's like, so when I get angry, that's how I pause. Have I ever done it? Give us an example. I think I was about a year and a half sober and I was on a train and there was a load of teenagers that were getting drunk and eating KFC and like throwing bones around. Oh, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I was going to like get involved. I yeah. thought I could just, I could just move carriage. I don't need to get shanked here. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I thought, have I ever done it? Have I ever been drunk on public transport? Or, you know, and it's like, of course I have. Mm. And it doesn't necessarily mean that person's behavior is right, but it gives me a little bit of time to reflect. And I think also realizing that, you know, it's not personal. Like, it's never really personal. Mm. Things that I used to get angry about. Again, going back to my ego back in the day, it was so out of control. Like before, if I went to tes Tesco and I bought a pint of milk and I went up to the cashier and went, you have a great day. Mm. My expectation was, well, thank you, sir, for being in Tesco. You have a great day too. But if I got a response like an eye roll, I'd be fuming. Mm. How rude, you know. There's one possibility that she hates my guts, but there's a million other possibilities. Maybe she's got a migraine or he's got a migraine. Um, maybe their cat's just died. Maybe they've got an abusive partner. But my ego or my alcoholism back then would say it's personal. Yeah. It's her stuff. How many times is it other people's stuff? Mm -hmm. What a relief and recovery to yeah. find that out. We have such an incredible ability to make it all about us, don't we? It's just, and when people say to me, oh, I really don't, like people that are in the madness and they're like, I don't think I can go to a meeting because everyone's going to be, we immediately assume everyone's going to be looking at me. Everyone's going to be worried about what I'm doing and therefore I can't go to AA. Like I'm too scared to go. And I'm like, trust me, everyone is just freaking out about their own stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's everyone's literally, that light is just shining, shining us. And so... Also, you have touched upon anxiety a little bit and kind of panic and, and those things, which I definitely drank on. I'd say it's actually probably the biggest thing I drank on um, back in the day, yeah. um, not able to deal with panic attacks and anxiety. Have Is that something you relate to? And is that something like how's that? What's that been like in recovery? Because I know it's something I've struggled with in recovery, too. Yes, um, it's a really good question. And, and I'll be honest with you, I've not had a panic attack since I've got sober. Oh, my God. Stunning. I've felt the rise of one mm -hmm. but the gun has never been pulled and i think my panic attacks were so so bad particularly in my 20s i started experiencing them at drama school i think i was put on beta blockers at one point oh, and yeah. on benzos and 
I had one in the West End one night. Then I was diagnosed with panic disorder, which meant I was having them very regularly. I, I just got used to them. I got used to the terror. Mm -hmm. um, I know that sounds crazy, but yet alcohol's helping me. Yeah. Clearly wasn't just because actually imagine. panic disorder came in when I was drinking more. So alcohol's terrible for anxiety. I know, I know in the moment it feels great, but it make it, we know. Everyone knows watching this. It makes it so much worse. Mm -hmm. I mean, not hang anxiety, like hang terror for me. Yeah. Now, I, I remember being in a budgeons in the morning going, if I don't check out with this bottle now, I'm going to have a panic attack in budgeons. Like mm -hmm. it was. And not just a panic attack, like I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Like this is curtains for me if I don't get this in. That's how it feels. It's, it's horrendous. And, you know, there's an amazing book by Christine Ingram called No Panic. And, uh, uh, We'll chuck it in the show notes if that's all right. It's your show today, so you get to decide. <laughs> Am I doing the show notes? Uh, it, it, I'm sure there's lots of good books on it, but it was a breakdown of everything that happens during a panic attack. And once I started to understand why my body was having such a extreme reaction, it, it calmed me down. And I started to visualize panic attacks as a, as a mouse with a gun that says bang. So when I... In the past, or even now, if I feel one coming on, I'm like there's a mouse again, and it's almost like you know, like one of those um, old cartoons where they got a gun and they're going, mm -hmm. and then they hit it, and then it goes bang. Yeah, because that's all it can do. It can't actually shoot you. The whole thing is, I'm going to shoot you, and you're going to die, but nothing happens. You just feel like crap, and then it passes. Every single thing that happens in a panic attack is designed to keep you alive. Mm. Oh, everything: the heart racing, the disassociation the the heart beat um beating really quickly the, the breathing all of that is to help you fight something or get away even dis disassociation which i think is one of the most horrible symptoms you know where you just feel like dizzy i'm not here like, yeah i mean that was designed for like if a bear ripped your arm off it wouldn't hurt as much mm -hmm. disassociation so everything that happens so maybe i was lucky but also getting into recovery yeah i've not had a panic attack since i got sober which is incredible yeah, that is incredible. And I'm so compassionate to people that have panic attacks, particularly young people, mm -hmm. you know. Um, well, anybody. Um, but I, I notice a massive rise in young people with panic attacks. I think just talking about it, being honest that it happens, is like you being brave sharing it now. Mm -hmm. And knowing what the symptoms are, like knowing that it is just panic. Not that it's just panic because panic is awful, but that, you know, I create the most awful that i've got diseases and there's all sorts of things yeah. going on when i'm in panic and um, sorry to interrupt even like simple breathing can really help like just breathing in for four seconds holding it for two breathing out for eight holding it for two and it's really important not to run away from wherever you are as well because then you're training the mind so if anyone's listening to this stay where you are breathe in for four hold it for two breathe out for eight hold it for two so I think sometimes the advice around panic attacks can be quite confusing. I quite like that because it's very, very simple. It's not going to solve it completely, but it's a start. I like this. We should record videos of you just coaching us all through our panic attacks. <laughs> I'd watch yes. them. Bless you. Um, and you've talked, as we've talked about 12, mm. the 12-step program and kind of other people you mentioned when you've called somebody that's in recovery, and I know that other people have been a really massive part of me yeah. being sober. Is it something you think you could have done by yourself? Or do you need other humans? For me, 100%, you need other humans. I mean, I think if you're suffering with addiction, to, to have an eye program is 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 crazy to me. Mm -hmm. I just don't understand how that can work when it's all about connection. Uh, I think addiction is about disconnection from self, from the, to the world around you. So then, you know, people leave treatment. I see it in rehabs and then they follow an eye program, you know, a willpower program and i think willpower gets a really terrible rap in recovery like willpower is really important like willpower's got me to a meeting willpower plays a part but if you make that your recovery it's not impossible you know i do know people that are a decade sober from willpower but are they happy or have they got a bulging yeah going. <laughs> but crucially you're still addicted i mean if you have to use willpower to not drink particularly after a, you know a bit of time has passed you're still addicted because mm -hmm. what you're doing is you're every day you're trying not to drink i'm sure you'd agree with this that i don't i don't ever think like that anymore i don't wake up in the morning and go i mustn't drink today it's it's just a natural thing it's a pleasure not to drink mm. as opposed to fighting it yeah so for me it's like a no-brainer mm -hmm. you know and, and yeah other people 
first word of step one we there it is bang tells me straight away yeah i need i need you guys not in a codependent way sometimes it's about helping others as we know um but for me as soon as i'm like i don't need the recovery community i am doing a moonwalk to the pub yeah you know what i mean i'm not aware of it but it is like for me that word we is everything yeah you know yeah, 100%. And I think it's so key as well when we're in that kind of I moment of I don't want to go to a meeting, I don't want to do this, or I don't need other people. I often find like just go and think about what you can offer to that room. Yeah. Like it's not just about what you can take from that room. It's about what you can give. And I think that was a massive for me to be like helping others. Yeah. Such a huge part of it. Yeah. And, and you know, it's like in the rehab as well sometimes people who are like 28 days in a rehab and you say you can go and help someone at the meeting they're like what do you mean i can help somebody mm -hmm. i'm sure you've found this in a meeting where you're sat next to someone who's on like day three yeah. and they turn around to you and they go how how long are you without a drink and you say nine years i mean we're like an alien yeah whereas if you're someone you say i'm a month you can actually help that person in some ways more in that moment mm -hmm. because it's like it's well you can tell me what the next month looks like like mm -hmm. nine years is like it's ridiculous yeah so it doesn't matter where you are on the journey there's you can always help someone, which I think is amazing. Yeah, incredible. And that it can just drain the power out of a drinking thought. Yes. By, well, either helping somebody or just speaking to somebody about a drinking thought, just going, oh, I really think I'm going to drink today. And someone else can go, well, that's ridiculous. I do. And you go, yeah, no, I said it to you. Yeah. <laughs> it is ridiculous. Yeah. And that community was huge for me. Yeah, definitely. Um, And in society in general, how have you found navigating sobriety? How have you found, have you noticed a stigma? Have you found it difficult because we live in a very drink heavy society in the United Kingdom? How, how have you found navigating that? Um, I found it really difficult at the beginning of my recovery, 100% difficult. Um, I think the way the world is 10 years on is, it feels like night and day, I'll be honest with you. I agree. And, and it's down to people like yourself, actually, being online. Uh, the work you do on TikTok, Instagram, socials, and hopefully a podcast soon, all the other things. And you. Yeah, but, you know, it really is because that stigma is being broke. I mean, it's almost cool to be sober now. I agree, yeah. You know, I mean, this 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 word, <laughs> sober curious, just, it's amazing. I mean, it makes me laugh because I was never curious about it. I was like... <laughs> It's like sober or dead. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But it's amazing. And, you know, you look at Instagram, I think sober is sexy, sober AF, which we know what that stands for, is always trending now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think probably that's why the podcast, that's why everything I feel like, why hide anymore? I was kind of hiding for a bit. I thought that people would judge me or... And people like yourself have carved the way for us to be much more open because... You know, if I if I recover louder, I think it it does stop other people dying quietly. I know it's a bit of a cliche. Yeah, that's powerful. I mean, I I didn't pick up a chip from. I picked up my nine year chip. The last one I picked up was four years. That's so funny. I did the same thing. Did you do the same thing? <laughs> yeah. Turned around to my sponsor, and he was like, "No, you need to go and show people that recovery is possible." And and I went and got my nine year chip. And so now, you know, I posted on my Instagram when I was nine. I'd never done that before. Ever, never, never publicly spoken about it, and and I think it's because I feel much more comfortable talking about it, mm -hmm. um, and we've got to be honest about it. I mean, I was even thinking about my rock bottom. Maybe I should, maybe I should dial it down. I mean, I could have dialed it up. <laughs> There's a few more. <laughs> yeah, but maybe I should dial it down so as not to offend or concern people, but. Like you do the same thing. We we got to show how bad it got so that people know that there is a way out. Yeah. People have to relate. People have to relate. And it's my story. And not everybody sinks as low as I did with it. And that's a really valid story too. Mm -hmm. But you got to own your own one and say, this is where I was at and this is where I am now. And I love recovery. I love my life today. Mm -hmm. you know, it's the best thing I've ever done. And like you said in, my, in, in your interview, I will never go back to it. No. Yeah. No way. No way. One day at a time, touch wood, but One day I agree with you. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of loving recovery, I think a really nice place to finish would be what yeah. has your recovery given you today? Wow. It's going to sound a little bit like uh, Bradley Cooper when he was asked that favorite one on, on Sober Celebrities Instagram. Yeah, I love that. But I feel like Bradley did 
in that interview, if anyone hasn't ever seen it, but it's like everything. I mean, it literally, I would have, I'd either be dead or I'd probably be a street drinker with no teeth drinking white ace. And I'm, I think you might be able to relate to this. Sometimes when I think about going back to drinking and I think, oh, I might end up on the street drinking white ice, my alcoholism go, sounds all right. Yeah. There's a bit of me that, that, that goes, that actually sounds all right. Yeah. There's a bit of me where it's like, yeah, that doesn't sound too bad. I remember going up for um, a very big Hollywood film a few years ago and I'm walking through Leicester Square and I'm suited and booted and I'm feeling great. And this guy comes up to me with a can of tenant super brew and he says, you got any spare change? And I saw him walk off and I thought, lucky bastard. Insanity. Insanity. Again, the liar. I don't think he's lucky, but there's a bit of me that goes, that looks great. Mm. And weirdly, that honesty, that there's something appealing about that, that rock bottom drinker, um, stops me. Because I can access being honest. Because that's where I would end up. I would either end up dead or, or I'd end up like that. Or worse, you know, locked up somewhere. Um, so it's literally, it's given me everything, including this breath that I'm taking now. Yeah. Amazing. How inspiring. And um, it's been a real pleasure interviewing you because we were all so intrigued and now we know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and thank you for everything you do. I know you were saying everything I do, but you also do so much for this community and it's really important. And this podcast is um, helping us make leaps and bounds in the right direction. So we thank, thank you too. Oh, bless you. Thank and you. Uh, thank you so much for listening. What do you want me to say to them? <laughs> Well, do you know what? Let's improvise this bit. Okay. Let's just say, oh, tell them, tell them to, uh, to like it. Uh, oh, that's it. Hit like on YouTube, um, subscribe on YouTube and that thing about, um, five stars on Spotify or something. Okay. Yeah. So to help us out, you can hit like on YouTube, you can subscribe on YouTube and you can also hit this, no, what is it? Stars. Yeah, you can, f uh, give it five stars on Apple and Spotify. Okay. Um, so please do go and like us on YouTube, go and subscribe to us on YouTube and also uh, hit the like. <laughs> I wasn't listening to what you said. <laughs> I just, That's so much just said it like that. <laughs> yes. Spotify and Apple. Go there too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>